For those of you who are joining us right now for the workshop, thank you so much for being here. We're really excited to have you. Uh, start out by just dropping in a comment into the chat section. Let us know, you know, where you're joining us from or, um, you know, what, what sort of a studio you've got if you want to and, and say hello. We'd love to hear from you and know where you guys are. And we're really excited to be doing this, so I'll jump right in. Um, I'll make an introduction. I'm, of course, Lyd Shaw, and I want to say thanks so much for joining us today for this workshop hosted by OWC and Recording Studio Rockstars titled Mastering Your Home Studio Mixes. So you're going to discover the best ways to boost and enhance your mixes in this workshop um, on playback. Oh, excuse me. You boost and enhance your mixes so that your music sounds like a finished record, because obviously, you know, you, you love the sound of records and you want your own music to come out sounding wonderful. If you've ever felt underwhelmed by your mixes or you've taken them out to the car, or listened to them somewhere else and they don't seem to sound quite like what you wish they would, then you might just need to do a little home studio mastering or send it to a, a professional mastering engineer like our esteemed guests here today. Um, and we're going to talk about all those things today in the workshop. So we have an awesome panel lined up for you. And let me just jump right in and make some introductions. Uh, we have J Ryan Smith is joining us uh, today. He's a mastering engineer at Sterling Sound in East Nashville. He's mastered records for a wide array of artists, including Greta Van Fleet, L. King, and ACDC. He's also become one of the most in-demand vinyl specialists around. Ryan has had the opportunity to work alongside legendary engineers and producers, including Phil Ramone, Arif Martin, Russ Teitelman, and Frank Filippetti, and as a mastering engineer with both Ted Jensen and the late George Marino. So, Ryan, thanks for joining us here. Give, give, say hello and, and wave to everybody. Hey, everyone. I'm Ryan. Th thanks, dude. Great to have you here, man. Thanks. Good to be here. So we also have Ian Shepard joining us. Ian is a British mastering engineer and owner of Mastering Media Limited. Some of Ian's incre credits include Keen, Tricky, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, Deep Purple, The Orb, Culture Club, New Order, and King Crimson, to name just a few. Ian also has a blog called Production Advice, where he teaches you how to master your own music with plugins in your DAW in your own home studio. And Ian is also the founder of Dynamic Range Day, an annual event raising awareness to everybody um, about the, the loudness wars. He's also created the plugins, perception and loudness penalty that help you nail your levels just right for, for streaming your music when you're mastering. So totally awesome. Ian, great to have you here. Please say hello and, uh, and give a shout to everybody. Hi, Lidge. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here, dude. Thanks for staying up late, man. Everybody, rock stars. It's it's uh, midnight right now where Ian's joining us from, so he's he's doing us a huge favor to be here. Awesome. Um, we also have Chris Graham is joining us today. So Chris is a multi-genre Billboard chart-breaking mastering engineer who has worked with thousands of artists through his business and mastering ChrisGrahamMastering.com, averaging fifteen hundred clients a year. Chris has developed powerful systems for managing his online mastering business. He's also co-host of the fantastic podcast, The Six Figure Home Studio Podcast with Brian Hood and helps audio engineers make a full-time living from the comforts of their own home studio. As a software designer, Chris has also developed an incredible app called Bounce Butler, which allows us to batch automated mix exporting from Pro Tools sessions and other DAWs to help speed up your workflow in the studio. A great tool, and I use it all the time for mixing out the podcast episodes. So, Chris, thanks for joining us, man. Please say hello to the audience and to everybody. Thank you, Lid. It's good to be here, guys. All right, so um, I will jump right in. Um, Rockstars, everybody joining us on this workshop, we're going to have a full Q&A segment at the end of the workshop, so please make sure to stick around and add your questions in the chat by using the button that allows you to use the Q&A feature. So if you if you use the, uh, the pull-down menu and switch to Q&A, add your question in there, and we're going to be collecting them as we go, and we make sure that they all get answered 
toward the end of the workshop. Also, just a reminder to everybody, please uh, make sure to turn off your phones and other items that are going to be distracting because you don't want to miss any of this great content that we're going to get into today. And I want to give a huge thank you to OWC, our host for this workshop. If you want fast drives for composing and recording your music in your studio, and you want to make sure that you have reliable drives for your backup and your archiving so that you don't lose any of your incredible work, um, OWC is a great place to find those for your studio. All right. Welcome, everybody. Great to have you guys here. I am going to jump in and we'll kind of kick off some questions. I think what I'll do is I'll probably direct a question at, at somebody to start, but, but I encourage everybody to please jump right in, Ryan, Ian, and, and Chris, and just jump right in and comment and feel free to, to sort of bounce around with any of these topics. Um, I'll jump right in. Uh, Ryan, I, maybe I'll start with a question for you. Uh, why don't you tackle this tough one? What is mastering? Uh, what's the difference between mixing and mastering, for example? Well, mastering is really like preparing something that's already been produced to be to go out into the world. So it's the last the last step to to make any adjustments um, before it's pre- presented to the consumer. You know, up to that point, mixing or uh, recording and mixing, uh, you're you know adding all those creative elements and and, and um, you know, creating your song both through uh, recording, overdubbing, and then mixing. When it gets to mastering, mo- all that sort of work is done, and now you're just we're trying to package it to make it um, to make it ready for consumers. So that um, that obviously means uh, you know EQ and compression to make it sound good and have life, um, but also you know formatting and whatnot. Um, yeah, you know, I talk a lot about vinyl. What I work and what I do, and that's where mastering started was vinyl cutting. It was that was the original mastering job and all that was initially was taking a real tape and turning it into a vinyl record and it's obviously evolved a ton over the years but um but essentially it's it's that it's taking that finished mix and making it ready to go out into the world for consumers to to uh to enjoy um that's awesome and i i apologize i was a little just in forgetting to um ask you know where are you joining from uh, tell oh, us yeah. a little bit about your space there in the studio yeah, sure. Uh, I'm at Sterling Sound in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. We know uh, Sterling is uh, traditionally a New York company, and, and we still have a, a New York studio. But uh, about uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, we opened up a, a new studio down here in Nashville, and that's where I'm that's where I'm uh, broadcasting live from now. Right on. And th- and your studio, of course, is pretty incredible looking. Can we get like a? <laughs> is it easy to do a little uh, laptop camera sweep? So yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So. Yeah, sure. so you can see it, it'd be easier to see if it was daytime out, but there's my speakers in the front. I have a surround system, so that's why there's a center speaker as well. The, spe- the speakers are like soffit mounted in the glass. And then there you can see uh, my racks, at least most of them. So, and over there, tape machines. So, you win, Ryan. It's <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very, very fortunate. Very fortunate. Right on. Um, Ian, would you introduce yourself and just kind of tell us about your studio where you're joining us from? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, I've been a mastering engineer for 25 years now. I worked for 15 years at a company called SRT here in the UK, was one of the UK's leading independent mastering facilities. Um, and I left shortly before they closed, um, which scuppered my plans because um, I was planning to dry hire their rooms and uh, those weren't available to me anymore. Um, so this is the little room that I set up at home. Uh, it's not a proper mastering studio. It's just a room where, you know, I can get stuff in from people, uh, give them feedback, give them opinions about whether their stuff's going to be benefit from mastering, record the podcast, record videos, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. I can't move the camera um, cause it's over there on a, a stand. No worries, man. No worries. Well, thank you for being here tonight and thanks for staying up so late. Sure. Um, why don't, why don't I get an introduction from Chris, too, and tell us where you are, and then Ian and Chris both jump in, and let's talk about what mastering is to you guys. Yeah, um, so I'm in Westerville, Ohio. That's uh, just north of Columbus. Uh, I'm in my office. I've got a couple different rooms that I use. Um, this is where we typically do the podcast and all the other businesses I work on. Um, but from a mastering standpoint, um, I got to give a shout out to Odyssey. Um, I use headphones most of the time now, believe it or not. I've got a couple uh, of their uh, pieces that the MX4s and the LCD 
X's and it's changed my life. It's been amazing to just be able to plug into a laptop and be confident uh, as I'm mastering. So I'm, I'm kind of all over the place. Sometimes I'm at a kitchen table. Sometimes I'm in a, a real room. Sometimes I'm here at the office. That's awesome, man. That's very encouraging to know that you can master in headphones like that. It was like a born again experience when I finally was like, yeah, <laughs> I can, this will work. Yeah, it was wild. Um, Ian and Chris, would you like to jump in and, and on this you know, issue of what is mastering? What does it mean to you guys? And what's the difference between mastering and mixing? Okay, so I have um, an analogy. I like to say that when you're mixing, you're balancing all of the tracks within a song or the channels within a song. So, you know, so you've got all the faders and you're, you're balancing all of those and optimizing the EQ and the compression and all of the processing on each one to get them to make the best possible song. And I like to think that uh, mastering an album is a bit like mixing the songs to make an album. So, you, mm. I mean, you could actually literally have every song um, in your DAW on its own fader with its own compression EQ settings and limiting settings and maybe some other bits of processing. And then it's, you know, where do those faders sit in relation to each other? You know, how loud should this song be in comparison to that? How much processing is there on each one? How do the EQs work against each other? Um, so I think that's quite a helpful way to think about it. And then my other favorite analogy, well, there's a, I have so many answers to this question. <laughs> I get asked it a lot. Um, I like to say that mastering is making the, the music sound the best that it can be. Um, you know, just wherever it is, trying to get an idea, have some empathy for what the client is trying to achieve and help them get it closer to where they would like it to be. Um, and then the final analogy is to say that mastering is like Photoshop for audio. So in the same way that you might adjust the color balance um, of a photograph or the maybe the crop or the, the brightness and the contrast or take out some little flaws, you know, um, that kind of stuff. You can do exactly the same thing for audio in the final stage. So, you know, you're talking about balancing, again, EQ and dynamics, um, maybe taking out little clicks or thumps or pops if there are any faults that need fixing, and then deciding how big, how small it should be in terms of how loud, how soft, all that kind of stuff. Um, so see if you like any of those. Yeah, that's great, Ian. I, I love um, when you talked about getting the songs to all play well with one another. And one of the illustrations I like to use when I'm describing this to somebody um, is to talk about movies. And so right now um, I'm in the middle of watching my favorite movie of all time, Lawrence of Arabia. And it takes me like a week to watch it because it's like four hours long. And it's just, it's this beautiful movie. And what makes it so great is the suspension of disbelief. So you, when you're watching it, you are completely tuned into this amazingly well-made movie and you lose yourself in it. You forget that you're watching a movie and you think you're there in the desert, you know, with all this stuff. I think that's the sign of a great movie. There's no weird moment that reminds you that this isn't really real. And I think in great mastering, you press play on a song or especially on an album and it transports you somewhere. It takes you uh, to an environment. And I remember as a kid, I was just obsessed with headphones. I love to put headphones on and just disappear. And to, to listen to a great mastered record is to put headphones on, to go somewhere else, and then to have that moment when the last song fades out and you're like, oh, I'm back. Okay. And I think like that's great mastering. Bad mastering is you're listening to a record and then suddenly you're like, oh, that's, this song sounds too bright or it's too loud. Let me, let me adjust something to make my experience more pleasant. That's broken the suspension of disbelief and no one's in virtual reality audio land anymore anymore. And I think, you know, a great mastering engineer knows how to keep the goosebumps on people's skin, the whole record. I think that's a, that's a great answer. Um, Ryan, let me, let me jump to you, spin that mm -hmm. over. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, what, what's the difference between what you guys see as mastering versus the people, the clients that you work with? What do they consider mastering? And mm. especially like what, what Chris just said, you know, the differences in levels between songs and all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, the mastering, like, like Ian made a really great point. It's the, it's really the first time that you, that the album really gets thought of as a unit, as opposed to individual songs. Um, up till then, you know, I mean, I, um, when you're in the record, in recording studio, mixing and ma uh, recording and mixing, you know, usually you're working on one song at a time. Um, and, mastering now you're going to start working on all the songs of the album you know together and to try to conceive of them as a unit so um 
Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit funny because these days, I mean, I'm guessing Chris and Ian, you might say the same thing. We're seeing so many singles versus albums. So it's changing a little bit. Yeah. Um, where the, the, the need to like match things uh, to each other are, becomes a little less of the daily task. I mean, when we get an album, that's still the task. But um, uh, but really, it is it's it's it is. I think what Chris said is really great about um, trying to create something that's going to give the people a focus and not give them a reason to break that focus when they listen to it. That's that's I, I hadn't really thought, heard that before. I like I like that. I'm going to cool. I'm going to steal that from you, Chris. Do it. But um, but uh, yeah, when you when you put a record on at home and and immediately you start reaching for controls that's the, <laughs> that that should not be if you're the, if you mastered that record you shouldn't be happy right then and there yeah but like ketchup um, on a steak right yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah this needs you know, salt pepper it's like no it's like it should just yeah so um so trying to like figure out when you get that mix in um you know what it's going to take to to create that that um that feel so that the listener is just like is captivated by it that's that's the trick i suppose it's interesting what um, Ryan said there about, you know, people mastering singles. Um, I try and avoid that. Whenever I get a new client, I try and encourage them to send songs in groups because I just think that context is really invaluable. Mm. But even if they won't, what I tend to do, I don't know about you guys, is I will actually, I have some clients where I just have, it's not an album, but it's a, a single session and I just drop all their new stuff into it. And I'm constantly referring back to anything else of theirs that I've mastered for them. So that in my head, I'm kind of building an album, even if they don't ever see it that way, just so that <clears throat> if somebody, you know, kind of clicks on them as an artist on Spotify or wherever it is, um, and they hear those songs together, in that case, um, you're going to hear the original loudness levels of the songs. So I want them to sit together and work well, and also the EQ balance and everything else. Um, so kind of in my head, I'm trying to almost, I guess, creating albums that some of my clients don't know about. Um, but the other thing that it made me think is just for, for people watching this, I think that that whole mindset of uh, making the songs work together um, and, and kind of imagining they're part of an album is really valuable. Um, and I would encourage people not to try and do mastering processing while they're mixing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's kind of completely possible these days. It wasn't when I started out. Um, there's, there's no reason you shouldn't put a ton of mastering processing on your mix bus or even try and master while you mix. But I think there's a real value in having the two processes separate. I mean, for me personally, I just can't cope with the, the overwhelm of, you know, one minute you're zoomed in thinking about, is that enough click on the kick drum and does it sit right with the bass? And then you're kind of thinking, okay, is this song kind of making me want to dance or smile or cry or whatever it is? So then kind of zoom out another level and think, and okay, how does it sit with track three or with what I did last month, you know, or with that other thing that I heard that I would like it to work against. I just think that's too much uh, kind of mental bandwidth. So I think there's a real value in you do the recording and the mixing process, you get the mix as good as you possibly can, then you take a bit of time, step back, um, and then move on to the mastering process. And you just kind of start to think about it in a different way, which is really valuable, especially if you're trying to work on your own stuff. You know, we all get to work on client work but you know part of this is i think going to be talking about home mastering where you're probably mastering your own music and that's a real challenge to just kind of disconnect yourself from everything that came before and hear it as somebody in the, in the real world will hear it for the first time um yeah that wasn't quite the question but i think it's an interesting point well i i love that ian like i really agree you know i, I think when you, when you do a panel like this, you have to have like some slightly controversial things to say to keep it interesting. And I completely agree, you should separate the two processes. And what I have noticed the most from my perspective of people that master their own music um, is I would say, yes, you absolutely should separate the two processes. And more importantly than that, you should absolutely not EQ your master fader while you're mixing. To me, that just is wild because you're saying every decision i made in the mix was wrong and i'll fix them all at once in the right hand side on that master fader and you start to go back and forth it's like a dog chasing his own tail and so when you when you separate them into two different processes mixing on one on one side and then mastering when you're all said and done there's a lot more room to be like oh this song feels a little bright compared to these other songs i'll pull that back and i'll tame that and <laughs> And I'm looking at the chat here and, you know, I want to comment 
one thing on what Gary Cable said here. He talks about my experience suggests that you should always mix uh, from the experience and then master that two track to a target comments. He said by experience, I mean, make it amazing sounding and interesting. I think one of the most important things as you're approaching mastering your own songs is to ask a really important question. I'm going to get really meta here. Why do humans like music? What's the point? Like when, if we dive all the way down and ask why 17 times, we're going to ultimately get to why do humans like music? And I don't have any idea. It doesn't make any sense why I, I put a pair of headphones on, I listen to a song and I get goosebumps, and then I listen to an arguably better song and nothing happens emotionally. I think, so to answer from my, uh, just my opinion here is I think whether you're mixing or mastering, you should always be working towards experience. You should always be measuring your results based on emotions. Does this give me goosebumps? Therefore, will it maybe give other humans goosebumps? And just keeping in mind, like, we still don't know why sounds seem to almost have, like, a spiritual component to them. That's really weird and really mysterious. And I, I think as we're doing this, a lot of, as we're mastering our own mixes, I think a lot of people get wrapped up in the tech. They get racked up, wrapped up in the uh, technical decisions that they're making. And I would imagine most people on this, that, that are watching this right now, probably are in that sort of zone when... I think you should be diving down and asking the question, what creates emotional engagement? And every decision you make should be driving towards that end. That reminds me of um, one of my favorite, the, the, the whole thing about, you know, kind of technical stuff versus emotional stuff. Um, uh, I always look less so nowadays because I don't do so, as many attended sessions, but especially when you've got the clients in the room and I try and notice it in myself, you're looking for the head nodding moment. Right? Yeah. That bit yeah. where you stop thinking about the settings and you're just like, like this or whatever it is you know maybe you're swaying around or whatever it's something you get some kind of physical reaction to the music that's when you know it's all working and totally totally right like way. likewise i like i like to when i'm working on something because you know when you listen to a song over and over and over again no matter how good it is it can start to lose that magic um so a lot what i like to do often is you know take a break from something and work on something else or even sit on it overnight if i don't have a, a deadline that, that that can't live with that and when i when I come back to it, I try to like, I sit like just far enough away, enough away from the console and the mouse and the keyboard. So I can't change anything and just listen to it and force myself to not, you know, start doing that again and see if it really does hit me and, you know, and, 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 and see if I can sit there and just be engaged with it for, for four minutes or however long the song is um, without just being like, Oh God, I gotta, you know, start, you know, changing more things. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a way you can kind of like, if you're working on your own stuff, that's a way you can maybe, you know, judge, are you getting that, you know, that emotional thing is like the step away for, for a minute, then come back to it and just force yourself to listen to it without touching the knobs and, and, and see if it's doing it for you. And if it doesn't, then, you know, dig back in and, and uh, try to get something that's a, even a little bit more. It's weird when you touch the knobs, that's like self-esteem. Every time you, you adjust something, you're like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And that, that desire for self-esteem has wrecked many a master in my studio. Mm -hmm. That's so funny that you mentioned that thing, Ryan, about sitting there and like, can I sit there and not want to? I just remember when I started out as a trainee, the first thing I started doing was copying tapes, just flat transfers from one place to the other. And sure. it, was, it was kind of torture because you'd be sitting there and you get about 10 minutes in, it's like... That sounds fine. And then the 50 minutes and oh, I, I, there's not enough 50 Hertz <laughs> or, the, or the, there's too much 2k or whatever it is. And after about half an hour, it's torture because you're just sitting there going, I want to fix this and you can't. Yeah. Um, let me jump in with a, a question at the risk of this being technical, but you guys talked about listening to, to it in different speakers and things like that. I know monitoring can be important. Um, I imagine between the three of us, we got a wide variety of what monitoring means. So tell us what that means to you guys, and what about to people you're working with, or if they're mastering on their own, what should they what should they think about as far as monitoring and trying to find that emotion? In other words, like how do you know when something's too bright or doesn't have the 50 hertz? Well, what I'd say with that is that you you need to have a monitoring <clears throat> setup that you're comfortable with that you know intimately. So it, you know, like Chris says, he works on headphones and like he knows those headphones. Like some people might be surprised at that, but that's, if that's what you know, and that's what it's, what sounds good to you, then, then that's what you're going to use. So it doesn't really matter what you have. 
you know, I mean, I'm, I've got, you know, like Slid said, the spaceship back here, which is, I'm, um, you know, like I said, I'm pretty fortunate, but you don't have to have that. You just have to have something that you know really well. And more importantly, you need to know what good records sound like on that system. So mm -hmm. find those records that you know, that you love, that give you those, those chills and listen to them a bunch on, on wherever you're going to monitor from. And so that you, you get the sound of like what finished and what great sounds like coming out of your setup and 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 keep it consistent um i think that you know um the uh monitor level is is crucial too and that um you know you, know, you pick like one or maybe two levels that you listen at and and keep it there because sometimes you know, you can like trick yourself into thinking things are good by just keep creeping up your monitor volume until you until you burn out and i mean it's like i don't know about you guys but i've got a spot on my monitor pot and then that's where it sits all day long mm -hmm. um and that, well, two spots, one for digital mastering, one for vinyl, just because vinyl comes off at a different level. But, um, but, and I, 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 no matter so, how much I want to, sometimes I don't let myself turn it up or down. Um, just because that, because I want to, I want to keep that consistency. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. I also have two monitoring spots, except that my other spot is not for vinyl, it's just a dim positions. So it's just 12 oh, dBs lower. Yeah. All right. So three for me. I have a dip button too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very critical. <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree. And it, if we can give something really practical, um, just for people listening to this, I would say you have a, I don't know how many stages it is. It's a few stages. That the first one is you want to decide how loud you're going to master. Then you want to bring in your reference material, which are those songs that you know really well and that sound great to you everywhere, like Ryan mentioned. Um, and then finally, um, you need to set the monitor gain, right? So how loud you master, that's a tricky one to decide. Um, probably the best thing is to choose something that you love and maybe match that, except chances are a lot of the stuff you're listening to that you love is probably mastered super loud and trying to achieve the same loudness could be really challenging and that might actually be detrimental. So uh, especially now that we have kind of the normalization online and all the rest of it, which maybe we talk about separately, um, there's not this pressure to be super loud anymore. So, you know, choose something that you think sounds great um, that's going to be your reference. If it's super loud already, maybe turn it down a little bit so you've got a little bit more room to work with. Um, if you want a number, my personal recommendation is you use uh, a loudness meter, an LUFS meter, and you find the loudest bits of the songs and set that the short term loudness of that to minus 10. Um, we could talk about that in more detail if you guys want to, and we could argue maybe about what the numbers should be. Um, but uh, whatever that loudness is, that's stage one. So then, so you then measure all your reference songs and get them to that loudness. So that you're listening to them at a consistent level and, you know, I mean, you measure it and then listen with your ears and make sure that your ears agree with the, the measurements. Um, then you've got those in your DAW as your reference material, and then you can set the monitor gain, your playback monitor gain so that, you know, I would say it wants to be good and loud, but not kind of fatiguing, not, not kind of uncomfortably loud. It wants to be loud enough to be exciting, to make you want to move, um, you know, nod your head, all that stuff, but uh, not so much that it kind of gives you ear strain. Because when you've done the process in that order, then really you can just use your ears. I mean, you can use all the metering and all the other stuff as well. But if you get it to sound right at that monitoring gain, it's going to be a similar loudness to the loudness that you chose for your reference tracks. And you're going to be in the right ballpark. And that's when, when you found that monitor gain, which takes a bit of experimentation then you don't touch it, like Ryan says. Um, and if you keep listening to stuff, my other tip is to just listen to music constantly. I mean, yes, the, the stuff that you love, but also just anything. You know, when you're soldering cables or doing your accounts or typing emails, whatever it is, just constantly have music on in the, in the room to learn what all your favorite music sounds like. It's like you don't have to pay any attention. You'll just subconsciously pick it up. It'll just kind of diffuse into you. And then when you go back to working on your stuff, you'll have this instinct over time of what it should sound like. Um, and then you will start to hear things like EQ and compression more clearly um, uh, and more accurately. And just, it's this really simple step, figure out what the right monitoring level is. And then, you know, China graph pencil or whatever on the, uh, you know, the volume control on your amp or the dials on the back of the monitors, wherever you adjust it. Um, once you have it, it's, that's like gold dust. Mm. Um, what about for you, Chris? How how does one arrive at a level for mastering with headphones? I mean, do you have to? Are there some risks when you're mastering at headphones? Too loud, too quiet, all that? 
Not necessarily. I, I find it to be very similar to mastering on speakers so long as it, it's a good pair of headphones. Uh, I think what, where a lot of people go wrong when they're trying to master on headphones is this opinion that all headphones are created equal, and that is could not they, – they vary in quality so much. And, you know, when I'm mastering on a pair of headphones, it's got to be open back. I've never mastered on anything that was kind of closed that felt natural to me. Um, but to go off something Ian said, you know, I really think setting the level, if you can keep your sanity when you're trying to master your record, you'll probably do okay. The challenge is how messed up in the head you get when you've spent all this time with the song and you're trying to make last minute goal line decisions and you start to overthink it and like, oh, I need 17 more plugins on my master bus to get, no, you don't. So I think with headphones, one of the things uh, I'm going to come back to with that is probably the best decision I ever made as a mastering engineer was um, when Tidal first came out, I signed up for Tidal and it was lossless and it was just sounded so, so, so much better to me than Spotify. And I made a playlist of about 12 songs and I titled it hashtag one ref. And I called it hashtag so that when I alphabetically sorted my playlist, that it would always go to the top. And I put a bunch of just all my favorite songs in there that I thought these are great sounding songs. These are uh, Take Five by the Dave Brubeck Quartet is like number one on every playlist I've ever made. That's the first song I want to hear. And when I'm listening to a new pair of headphones or a new speaker or I'm in somebody's car or whatever it happens to be, I want to acclimate and get a feel for what flavor are the headphones or the speakers or whatever it happens, the environment, whatever it happens to be, what flavor is that bringing to it so that I don't can get confused about what's the speakers, what's the room, what's the equipment. I need, I need to neutralize and, and get used to that environment. And having that go-to playlist uh, made it so that I could quickly try new equipment um, and get used to it. And one of the things I think where headphones really have an advantage over speakers is like Ian said, I think the key is, that's awesome, David uh, Street, I think I said that wrong, says I use Take 5 as a reference too. Um, but one of the great things about headphones is you can use them all the time. You can outrun somebody with speakers simply because you can have them on, you can, if you're crazy, you know, you can mow the lawn like that <laughs> if you've got a quiet mower. But a perfect example, I mentioned, you know, I'm watching Lawrence of Arabia right now. And, you know, every year or two, I watch that movie and just marvel at what an amazing piece of art it is. But I'm listening to it on a pair of $3,000 headphones. So I'm sitting there watching a movie, entertaining myself, still getting used to how those headphones sound. And, you know, you can't be in the studio 24 hours a day. And with headphones, I'm not saying you should only master on headphones, but I think having a pair of headphones that you can take with you you know i see uh lit, um ian's got what are those 650s in the background spectacular headphones those are absolutely wonderful and pretty affordable too um, well oh go ahead well, go ahead and finish if, you, if you're finishing yeah i mean just my thought is have a playlist that you'd go to that's not 50 songs but like a dozen songs at the most and just listen to that everywhere that you possibly can um and i think that just gets a, it gets a lot easier to know where you sit to have a, a playlist that you just know like the back of your hand. Awesome. Well, let me let me spin it back to you, Ryan, and let's um so we don't run out of time and we touch on some of the technical stuff. Sure. What are the tools that that um, we should be thinking about if we're going to start mastering? You know, with this understanding of levels and stuff. What are, you know? How do we use things like EQ, compression, limiting, any of those? Just just a sort of a basic introduction. I imagine people sort of want to know like what order would we use them in as well, and is it different than mixing? Um, yeah, well, I, I would probably first circle back to what Ian said about, um, mixing and mastering simultaneously. I would also agree that it'd be best to separate those two processes. Um, I think when you, when you math, when you mix into a mastering chain, you know, assuming that, you know, you're going for like, you know, a, a modern, you know, rock or pop type sound, you're probably going to be going relatively loud and uh that mastering chain can i think sometimes end up being a crutch on your mixing side of things where you're not really hearing things or the the compression or eq is working against 
mixed moves that you're making. So, you know, I kind of had a, you know, kind of learned the hard way a few times earlier in my career where I would get things that were really heavily bus processed um, in from clients. And I'd ask them if they, oh, can you take that off? Cause it'll be better if I master with it off. And then I, what I would get back was like, it's like the mix completely fell apart. And I realized this, oh, they're, they're mixing into this stuff. If you can't take it off at this point, you can't undo it. The whole mix um, relies on that mastering chain. So I would really recommend, um, you know, either a light touch on the master bus when you mix or, or none and, and save your mastering for, af for, uh, for, you know, a, a separate, a separate stage. Um, I've gotten into as, so much. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. I've gotten into so much trouble with the exact same thing where I'll, you know, I'll ask a client, could you take your mastering bus process off? And it's like part of the upload form um, for me. And if they're using a lot of EQ in mixing, they'll take that off and I'll get it and be like, Hmm, <laughs> like, I'm going to have yeah. to be more aggressive than I'd like to be. And I don't think they'll approve it if I add six dB at 10 K on, you know, their masters, not knowing that that's exactly what they did. Yeah. And so that's for that reason, if they do have master bus um, effects on, I'll usually ask for both. Can, you know, can and I likewise, hear? If, if you're, if you're mixing and you need 10 D or 60 B of 10 K on your master bus, then maybe you need some more 10 yeah. K sprinkled throughout all the other elements of your mix. Totally. Yeah. Pump so the brakes. That, that, that's, 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 that's kind of what I'm talking about where you're, it's like, like the mastering bus be kind of becomes a crutch for everything else. So yeah, totally. Ian, do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, just to finish off that point completely, I'm going to completely disagree with you guys. Um, often when I'm mixing, I will put EQ on the, not compression. I'm not a big fan of compression on the, the master output, but I do quite often use EQ because if I'm listening to it and just thinking, oh, well, the cymbals sound a bit dull and the vocals could do it. Why put EQ on 24 tracks, 36 tracks, whatever it is, when you can just add a single move on the, uh, the mix bus. But I would agree. I'm, some people mix into heavy compression. Some people don't. Um, I think either is fine. Um, but personally, I prefer to be able to achieve the results without heavy processing on the, the stereo output um, for exactly the reason that Ryan says. I don't like the idea that if I take one processor out of the chain, um, you know, my mix falls apart. Mm. Um, so uh, there's that. Just to come back to your question, Ledge, about the, the order that people do the processing, I have fairly strong opinion about it. Uh, which would be interesting to see whether the guys agree with me. I would say set the level first. So just bring the raw mix up to whatever your chosen mastering level is going to be. Um, the reason for that is that if you don't, you're not hearing it accurately. Um, there's this thing called the, the loudness curve or the equal loudness curve or the Fletcher Munson curve or the smile curve, uh, which basically says that as you turn things up, our ears pick up more bass and treble. Nobody knows exactly what it is. Um, it might be, uh, Lid, you've heard me say this before, an evolutionary process where uh, we have evolved so that we pay more attention to uh, the Jaguar that's just over there uh, breathing down our neck rather than the one that's over there stalking the herd of gazelles, right? Because threats that are nearby are more of a threat and therefore should be more interesting to us. And maybe the brain makes sounds that are louder and therefore seem closer, more exciting. Nobody knows, but it's a fact that if you just turn stuff up, you hear more bass and treble. So if you turn that backwards, if you don't get the level of the music right to begin with, and you make a bunch of EQ moves, and then you turn it up, your opinion about whether those were the right EQ moves or not is gonna change. And chances are you're gonna have added too much bass and treble and you'll end up going around in circles. So for me, stage one is always get the level set right. Um, that's also a great thing because it means that if maybe that's all it needs, you know, if you have 10 songs that are really well mixed, um, maybe all you have to do is get the levels of them correct relative to each other, maybe some very light limiting just to catch the peaks and you could be there. Um, if so, then fantastic. That, that, that album is just as mastered as one that had the kitchen sink thrown at it. Um, but you know, usually that's not the case. Usually there are some EQ tweaks that you want to make. So I would say level first, then EQ, get the EQ moves right so that the, the sound is balanced, not matched, but balanced. Um, well, we could talk more about that if you wanted. Um, and then you can think about dynamics. So it's like, okay, well now that's the right level and the EQ sounds right, but uh, there's too much contrast between the verse and the chorus or 
a particular element of the mix is sticking out too much or I just want to kind of glue it together or I want to give it more bounce and more feel, whatever it might be. And that's when you might bring in some compression. Um, and then at the end of the chain, I have a nice clean digital limiter just to keep things under control. You might also use a kind of character, you know, an analog piece or an emulation um, if you like. Uh, but um, you know, that's a kind of separate process. So for me, it's always level EQ um, dynamics. Um, but the, then the key is when you get to that final stage, then you listen again and go, well, does the level still seem right? Because mm -hmm. if you've changed the EQ and you've changed the dynamics, that might change the way the loudness sounds to you. So there's a good chance that having made those things, you go, oh, okay, well, actually now it's a little bit too loud or it's not quite loud enough now with that extra compression that I put in. So you tweak that. And then that affects the way that you hear the EQ and the dynamics. So you have to think about them again. But if you're lucky, you go round and round in circles through that process, just iterate over and over. And every time the moves get smaller and you just kind of focus in on that ideal finished sound. So that's, that's my recommendation. Do you guys have anything you want to add to that, Ryan and Chris? Um, one, one thing I like this, I mean, I have it. You know, like kind of like permanently hardwired in my studio, but you can certainly set it up on any kind of a DAW is to have a, um, we refer to it as a monitor offset. So um, it, it'd be a, a second output where you, you take your your flat mix and all, all you apply to it is level. And you can just use like whatever, you know, like like end, end of chain limiter to it and just crank the level up to the same amount. So you can, you can AB back and forth between that, strictly leveled version of, of your of your mix versus whatever EQ changes you're making. So I, I mean that's that's kind of how I'm set up and what I'm doing all day. I'm constantly going back and forth to like what was sent but flat flat but with level um compared to what I'm doing to it. Um you know you know we, we keep coming back to like monitoring level and, and levels in general but levels are really sneaky things. You know, you could take I can I can bring you into my studio and take the exact same file and turn one of them down up a third of a dB or down a third of a dB and then tell you that they're two different things and, and have you listen to them and you will swear not just that the louder one is 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 better you'll people will make all sorts of like crazy you know speculations oh it sounds bigger it's warmer it's brighter it's wider it's you know it's all this kind stuff like cinnamon and butter and some yeah, cream and cheese on is, that one and all it is is a third of a db or even like a tenth of a db louder so it, so that's why i i'm i'm always trying to like do this kind of like level matching so that when i do that comparison on whatever like eq or compression i'm doing i'm hearing just that and not being tricked into thinking it's better just because it's a skosh louder so so how do we know when things are too loud guys and um, anybody want to jump in on that? I think it's a pretty simple answer to that question. If it starts to sound worse, it's too damn loud. And that's the other reason to do the to do the switch yeah. too. It's like <laughs> do no harm, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Do no yeah. harm is yeah. absolutely your number one priority in all of this process: mixing, mastering, editing, everything. When you're making art, just do just don't make it worse. And I think that's what's so hard. Like you get fixated on are people going to like this are they all going to laugh at me uh, i'm going to show my mom's going to hear this song uh, like you start to make weird decisions when you're going to show everybody that you know something that you've worked on and it's that battle of not letting your ego completely ruin things uh that i think is the hardest and what often says well i'm nervous to release this so i'm going to do a deep dive on different types of dither and I'm going to get super fixated on something kind of esoteric so that I don't have to show anyone what I've worked on yet. And I think that you shouldn't spend eight hours mastering a song, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I'd completely agree with that. I would put the two things that Chris and Ryan said together. Um, absolutely. It's when it's, it's too loud when it starts to sound worse. But to know whether it sounds worse or not, you have to do a loudness matched comparison with how it was before, like Ryan said. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually, it's so important that I made a plugin to help with it, um, which is called Perception. And it's basically, uh, it's literally that. It's a one click match the loudness before your mastering chain and the loudness after your mastering chain and then allow you to bypass it 
to hear that comparison. So, you know, Ryan has his analog chain that enables him to do that and, and uses his years and years of experience to get the loudness matching uh, accurate. This thing does it automatically, um, which is possibly arguably not as good, but it's still incredibly helpful. Um, and so, yeah, you do those. So, so because it's not a question of how loud it is. There's no problem with loudness. Everybody loves loud music. You can just, you can turn music up as, as loud as you like. The problem in digital is that you have this zero dB ceiling where you, you can't go any louder. It's going to distort. It's going to clip. So the question is, if you want to turn it up and you're going to hit that and you want to stop it clipping, how do you achieve that? So it's, it's not a question of how loud it is. It's how did you make it loud and what processing was used on the way? So some really light limiting is probably not audible and not going to hurt the music at all. But really heavy limiting can be very, very audible. So maybe if you want to get it that loud, you need some limiting and some compression or some soft clipping or some saturation or, or some other kind of processing to, to do that. But whatever you use at the point where you think it's perfect, then you need to, I would say, turn the mastered version back down so that it's the same level as the original and flick between them um, and just, you know, listen to it and think, okay, is that still better? Does it still sound, or actually have I lost some of that punch? Have I lost some of that depth and that, impact and that excitement in that case you've probably gone too far or you need to improve the methods that you use to get it loud at least um so it's you know yeah we keep talking about loudness but it's it's just at the heart of everything well guys let me let me jump in for a sec because we're running towards the end of this and we do have some great questions so i want to make sure we get a chance to to uh, answer those those have all been fantastic answers, though, so far, and, and telling us about this stuff. So let me jump in. Here's one. Uh, this one, first one, comes from John um, McLucas. Uh, he said, "What are the most?" He's a common... wonderful human being, by the way. He's just fantastic. <laughs> if you guys don't know John, what a sweetie. Yeah, well, he's fantastic. Also for giving us his question. So, what are the most common reasons you're having to tell the mix engineer producer to rework the song? I I try to not do that as much as possible. That's the that's that's my answer. It's I don't, I'm not a mix engineer, and I feel like every time I try to give mix advice, it just backfires on me because I don't you know there's a reason why things sound the way they do do in the mix, and I don't know what I don't know where the bones are buried in those in those multi tracks. So unless something's really, really egregiously out of whack, or if it's an engineer who I work with a lot where I have a a good relationship and I know I'm not going to foul it, I try to stay away from that and just do my best with what they've given me. Fantastic. I think my dog Daisy knows where the bones are buried though, but you guys have any comments on that? I think there's only a few things that I often uh, find myself asking for, and it might be vocal up or vocal down um, at the most. But like, I think as a mastering engineer, like Ryan, you nailed it. Like our number one job is to honor the art that's been given to us, not to dramatically change it. Yeah, and absolutely. there's a temptation to want to see yourself as like the hero. I, it's the last moment and here we go. And, oh, now the song anymore. Like, <laughs> thanks mastering. So I, yeah, I, I think you, you want to be light handed and, and try to honor, but if it's an MP3, I'll say something. If it's already been limited, I'll say something. And maybe if, the, if, if there's a small move, I'm I'll give advice on that, but I try to, I try to honor people as much as I possibly can and not see myself as a wizard. Of Chris, sort. do you mind um, giving us as quickly as possible? So we move through the rest of these questions. What is the trick for determining if it has accidentally become an MP3 somewhere in your process? Oh man. Yeah. We talked about this beforehand. Um, let me see if I remember the trick. It's been a while since I've done it. So I, I use the Avocet. And the Avocet's like this monitor controller that's like a super awesome piece. And if I, what is it? If I reverse the phase of the left channel and then make it mono, uh, any sort of aliasing like that you would get, especially on cymbals and stuff in an MP3 is just like, hey, like really, really easy to tell. And I've had a couple occasions when I've been working on a project this happened on a film one time where they were, getting to, they were going to put like all the songs they bought on iTunes in their featured film. And it was like, no, <laughs> but I was able to catch it just by like pushing a couple of buttons and then, you know, giving it a quick listen and being able to tell. 
Awesome. Let me jump to the next one. Um, this one comes in from Louis um, Ramos. Do mastering techniques differ, differ for music versus film production, having mentioned film? Maybe, Ian, if you have any thoughts about that, too. I think, I think it depends what you mean. I mean, the film has, for film, you have the dub, um, which is where, you know, you, everybody's seen those shots of the mixing desks that go, and that's where they're bringing in the dialogue and the foley and the effects and the music as well. Um, but you don't do music mastering at that stage. I mean, that's effectively the mastering stage for a film, um, but it's not mastering because it's still kind of mixing. Um, I mean, one of the things about film is that uh, most cinemas are set up using either Dolby Digital or uh, THX specifications. So you, I mean, we were talking about fixed monitoring gain cinemas have a fixed monitoring gain, which is why if you go and see a film where it's not quite loud enough or it's too loud and you complain, you know, the, the projection is, is going to be, I can't do anything about it. You know, the volume controls over there in a locked box <laughs> protected by tigers. Um, so, but if you're mastering music that is going to be used in a film, I don't know whether that's what the question is. For me, I don't do anything different. I mean, there's even less pressure to go super loud because film has so much more dynamic range and headroom available to it than the digital formats that we're, you know, to the to CD or to the streaming services. Um, so, you know, you really don't have to push the, the levels high, um, but I don't master super loud stuff like that anyway for, for preference. Um, so I just do what I normally do. Um, and I always get great feedback. You might also have to work with surround sound, but that's a whole other kettle of fish. <laughs> Anybody else got any other thoughts or should we jump to the next one? I don't really do a lot of film stuff, so. All right. Yeah. I do know one thing, having done a little bit of um, mixing music for film and mixing a film soundtrack, if you have wild levels between the music and then they go show it in a theater, like a, a um, independent theater, or maybe it's like a 48-hour film project here, you will blow up the speaker system in the theater if you accidentally leave the music really loud at full full master level during the middle of the of film. That sounds fun. <laughs> okay, here's here's another one. This is also from Louis um, or Lewis. Okay, usually the format for audio CD is forty four one sixteen. Um, again, Always. it says forty four one kilohertz sixteen bit. Now because of the digi world, you can change the format to forty four twenty four forty eight twenty four bit. Um, I guess it, I'm not sure if, how that question is. Maybe what what do you guys want to say about file formats when you're mastering? So I'm going to, this might be controversial. I'm going to say you should still supply pretty much everything at 44, 16. Um, the streaming services can actually cope with different sample frequencies and bit depths. Um, but there's so much confusion out there because you, you, you can't send stuff direct. Well, you can send stuff directly to Spotify, but the chances are most people are sending their stuff to an aggregator, right? So to TuneCore or DistroKid or one of these uh, companies that are going to upload the music to all the different platforms, um, their specifications change. And basically, I don't trust them to do a good job of turning my 2496 master into whatever is needed for... Uh, <laughs> For their yes. service. Amen. Um, the only exception to that would be if it's a service that specifically supplies high res files. So Tidal, Quobuz, HD Tracks, um, Apple, um, iTunes, they're, they're mastered for iTunes thing. They can accept high res files and they will do a good job of it. Um, so, yeah, even though you can theoretically supply higher spec stuff, I would say stick for 1644. And also because, I mean, it sounds amazing. You know, if you, if you do it right, um, it sounds incredible. So why not? Yeah, when I when I master, I, I master at whatever the highest resolution it comes in at at 24 bit. But my final my delivery to my clients for their references is 4416. So if you send me 9624, I'll I'll master it at 9624. But then I'll do my own conversion down to 4416 and deliver that to you. And then also then you're getting the lowest resolution that it's going to go out into the world. Then and, and we, you know that's which is which is beneficial if it sounds good there it's only going to sound better going back upstream and then i also have the high res masters available if you need them for a for a high res service as well um is it smart for clients to ask you guys as pro mastering engineers 
to also, can you please send me the high res one? So I've just got it in the folder at home or whatever for the future. Yeah. Might as sure. well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, most future professional yourself. mastering services will keep the stuff archived and could produce it at a future date. Um, but you know, if, if you get it at the time, if they charge extra, it's going to be likely to be uh, reasonable. Um, and then, you know, you've got the files. All right. Yeah. Kobe. Most mastering engineers, like to, to go off what Ian said and to give a plug to our sponsor here, have an enormous hard drive, like me, the Thunderbolt 4 from OWC with 12 terabytes of space. Like, yeah, yeah no, yeah. I was going to ask that too. Um, you know, what do you guys do for backup and, and, and what's important to know about backing up all your stuff and just keeping it around forever? Let me, can I grab that one? Um, yeah. One, um, I will never forget the first time I ordered my first OWC. SSD and I put it in my G5 and I ran my boot drive off an SSD and it was this like, oh, like the most glorious day. My computer ran so much faster. So I would say one, uh, your life will be so much easier if you are positive that your boot drive is an SSD. Two, uh, use a separate drive for your data. Um, OWC, uh, if an SSD is small enough for you, use an SSD for sure because they're faster. Um, but if you need a lot more space, um, especially if you're doing video as well, having something that has a RAID array in it, so you have multiple drives uh, that make a giant hard drive that actually reads and writes faster, that helps. And then a plug to, uh, there's a product called uh, Backblaze. It's like $5 a month. It just backs up everything at night to a separate server somewhere. Backblaze is amazing. It's so good. Backblaze didn't work for me, unfortunately. So I'm looking mm. for an alternative. So if anybody can recommend um, a cloud computing alternative, I don't know why I had terabytes of stuff. It, it was uploading for two months and then it failed. So that's how mine was. To bag up this Thunder Bay, I think took over a month for me. Yeah. It was um, crazy. I would only add to Chris, basically you need to have uh, digital audio, digital data doesn't exist unless it's in two places. So every drive that I have on my system has an, uh, another drive that is the same size or bigger and every at least once a day everything on that drive gets updated to match what's on the drive that i'm working from so if the drive that i'm working from dies i can just plug in the other one and go um i need to get an off-site backup system uh running as well um but um, and then in terms of archiving basically at the point where the drive is full i just it goes in the, the cupboard at the back of the room there um, and I buy another one that's like probably 10 times the size of the first one and that becomes the new drive and I keep going. Um, we can't guarantee that the drives aren't going to eventually die on the shelves, but um, unless you, there's nothing else big enough to hold all of the data. So how about Sterling? They must have a massive archive. Um, well, we recently, in the last couple of years, developed a, a sort of proprietary uh, cloud archiving system. So everything for long-term storage long-term storage that's where it goes and um uh we have look we have uh our studios are networked so there's I, there's another machine on premises so all my my work for each day gets backed up to like ian said another drive on, an, on a whole separate computer so not just that the drive dies but the whole computer dies i've got that um in a second mm -hmm. location and then i'm paranoid so i just like keep extra usb drives around and even when i send it to that cloud system i'll still copy stuff off onto usb drives and like like ian said stick it in a in a uh in a drawer in a in the cabinet in the back of the room when it fills up and to start a new one um yeah you, you the trick is you can't have too many copies of stuff well maybe you can but but you, you need to have more than more than one you know for sure well you definitely need to have one when somebody asks you for it right <laughs> absolutely yeah all right well let me jump up i, I actually the question's probably been up there visible for quite a while, but this one Can comes I grab in. One more on that, Lidge? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, sure so ahead. I'll be really, really fast, I promise. So I play guitar, and when I was a kid, my guitar was terrible. And it had rusty strings, and the action was really high, and it made it no fun to play. I think with this conversation about hard drives, um, running off the fastest possible drive that you can get is just like having a guitar that's set up well. It makes it so much easier to stay in flow state and to just move quickly and not be like, oh, I'm waiting. Oh, like there's a pause, there's a delay, there's latency. So for me, I'm just all about the faster your drive is, the faster your read write times are, the more fun you're gonna have making music. It really makes a big difference. 
All right, so I'll jump to this. This question comes in from David Rockower. Um, and David says, I would love to have an opinion on mastering in the master bus versus a standalone app such as Ozone. I think you guys covered that a bit before. Um, I produce many short pieces of music for video use and typically use EQ and limiting on my master bus. Um, anybody who wants to jump right in on that. I think we, we kind of covered it. I, I think we don't recommend it. Um, I understand why people do it. Um, but I think, um, I think it's difficult to keep perspective. Um, there's a risk that you end up using it as a crutch, um, in terms of the, <clears throat> the mixing techniques that you're using. Um, yeah, that's basically, <laughs> All right. that's basically it. I mean, in, in terms of like, uh, using a standalone, there's no reason you shouldn't do mastering in the same DAW that you mix in. Um, I mean, I use. WaveLab for mastering. Uh, it has kind of dedicated mastering features like DDP files for CD masters, um, all the metadata support, being able to support export in a ton of different formats really easily, all that kind of stuff. You know, really fine control of track IDs and fades and all that kind of thing. Um, but you can use anything you like for actually doing the sound work. You know, there's no like, I mean, for, so for example, using Ozone, there's no uh, difference between using the Ozone as a standalone app and Ozone as a plugin on in, in whatever piece of audio software you have. Um, so, but whichever way you're gonna do it, I think that the key thing is, so it's not about where you put the processing, it's just a different, it's a different process. It's a different time. It's like, do the mix, take a rest, few days ideally, come back to it for, for, with fresh ears. Because one of the benefits to going to um, a mastering engineer is to get an objective opinion and also to get your music heard on hopefully a super high quality system but definitely a system that's different than your uh system because something we haven't talked about you know one of the benefits of using headphones is that it uh takes your room out of the equation mm -hmm. in terms of monitoring one of the most beneficial things you guys can do um at home is to add some acoustic treatment you can see a couple of panels in the back there there's more in front of me there's over my head here to control the the sound of the room, you know, that's the single most effective and affordable upgrade you can give a home studio is to, if you don't have any acoustic treatment. And even if you do have, if you do have <clears throat> like the cheap foam, or like maybe not even cheap foam, but the foam stuff kind of helps, but it's not really super effective. You want the the stuff that Real Traps and GIK sell, the, the kind of big broadband absorbers. Um, so getting the sound in the, the room right. And if you don't do that, well, even when you've done that, the chances are there's still going to be some quirks of either your monitors or your room. I mean, even professionally designed, acoustically designed studios have things that are not quite right about them. They'll have, you know, there'll be one point where you sit and there's not quite enough of this frequency or there's too much of that. There's no such thing as a completely flat room, especially not in every possible location. So if you mixed and recorded in that space, and then you try and master in that same space, that the, the whatever was hidden from you by the monitoring, whatever it might be, is still going to be hidden from you at that point. Um, so one of the advantages of going somewhere else is to get that second opinion, get that objective opinion and uh, get it heard in a different way. And one of the things I'd recommend if you're trying to master your own music is to go and listen to it in another space that you know really, really well, whether it's earbuds that you listen all the time on or a home stereo or in the car or whatever it is, um, to get a fresh perspective on the music, but also that where I started, that separation between the mixing process and the mastering process, so you have a bit of time, you can come to it with fresh ears and just hear it in a new way um, is really valuable. So I think that's why I wouldn't recommend doing the processing at the same time as mixing. It's not whether it's on the bus or not, it's not at the same time. Okay, great answer. Um, let me spin it over to you, um, to you, Ryan. This is another question from David. Maybe we can answer this one quickly. He said, is mid-side EQ and mastering a thing of the past? No, absolutely not. <laughs> I have it both in analog and digital forms. Um, uh, no, mid-side is a, is a super powerful tool. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say about it, but besides that, you know, I use it um, pretty much on almost everything. I mean, yeah, everything, but quite a lot of things. It's Being incredibly like... powerful. It's what I call a Spider-Man process. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Yes. Yes. Um, Amen. You, yes. you can achieve minor miracles with midside uh, EQ in mastering. And I wouldn't recommend using midside compression, by the way, but midside EQ 
um, but you can also cause a whole ton of problems. So just yeah. be careful. Definitely agreed. And I agree with you about the compression thing. I almost never use it in uh, compression in midside, but, um, but midside EQ, especially, I mean, when you're trying to, you know, when you, I find it especially um, beneficial on the low end, just being able to like, you know, most rock pop mixes, the bass and the kick drum are up the middle and be able to like affect them without affecting like the low end of guitars, keyboards and other things that are on the outside. Um, Another trick I do a lot of times is, is to roll low end out of the sides to help um, clear the and focus the center of the of the image on the low end. Um, so, no, it's, it's it's definitely not a thing of the past. And um, I mean, it's great because there's so many plugins now that have it as just a standard feature um, and to do it pretty well. Um, so, yeah. But yeah, but, but Ian's also right. You, you got to be judicious with it. You don't want to. You can get carried away and all of a sudden you have a mix that like sounds like it's like, you know, flying <laughs> around your head and yeah. out of phase and whatnot. Um, let me let me ask this too. This was a question that came in from Corey. Um, and it's related to what you're talking about the tools and you had mentioned isotope and, and ozone and stuff. Um, what do you, what do you guys think of automated mastering tools? For example, isotopes ozone has a feature in it that will help you get, you know, get to a certain point. How how should people think about using any of those tools? Let me hop in on this. So I'll go back to my initial question. Why do humans like music? We don't know. When you're writing code, when you're trying to build an algorithm, you are you have to have input that you use to dictate the logic. Mastering and any other kind of art is deceptively difficult to write AI around because you can't cue off the human soul. You can't look at it and say, well, this will make people more emotional than this will as, as a computer, unless you are keyed into a human. So while I do think it's always getting better and it's going to continue to get better, we need to keep in mind, like, there are significant limitations uh, with AI when it comes to art, because we don't understand art. We just know we like it. I think that's a great answer. I would uh, go back to... I mean, on the one hand, what the AIs can do is pretty amazing, pretty impressive. You know, they, it's like with some material, in some cases, they can produce quite okay results. Um, but if you, if you go back to the mastering as Photoshop analogy, um, you know, in Photoshop, if you're tweaking images, a pro color grading specialist is going to spend hours choosing how much blue there should be, how much red, what are the skin tones? Do I do the same thing on this part of the images on there? You know, depth of field, all that kind of stuff. We go in there and press the wizard button, right? And the magic, the, the, the wand, and it goes ping and it looks better. Um, that's kind of, for me, what those automated processes are. Um, if you're lucky, because, because that's the other thing. Sometimes you click the magic wand and it doesn't look better. You know, it either looks worse or it just looks the same. Um, if you're lucky, those automated mastering processes can give you a reasonable result. I think what I would say, out of the options, you know, there's the online ones that just kind of give you a, a finished product back um, and you have almost no control over it. I haven't used Ozone Mastering Assistant, but what I understand about it is that it basically gives you some suggestions and you can then tweak those. And I like that idea much better than the online kind of one size fits all thing. I think you know, if, especially if you're starting out on this stuff and you're kind of like, well, what is my music supposed to sound like? I mean, A, remember the suggestions we gave you for getting reference material and setting the levels and all the rest of it. But yeah, why not plug it through the, the, the mastering assistant and see what it gives you and see if you like it. Um, but don't just kind of assume that that's what it should sound like. It's like, if you listen to it and go, well, I like this, but I don't feel like I want to dance as much. That was a bad thing. And you either tweak the settings so that, uh, you can improve on it or you just throw it away. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if you want to experiment with them, you know, why not? I, I think that if you're at this seminar right now and like you decided to give up your Thursday night to like listen to the three of us pontificate about mastering, then you owe it to yourself to dig in there and, 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 and mess around with it and not have something do it for you. It's, I mean, those things maybe are good starting points to kind of get an idea of where you should go, but, but don't be afraid of it. It's, you know, if you're already this far into the process, you know, yeah, I, the, think, you, the, I think you owe it just to, 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 to try to do it. And yeah, um, yeah. 
it's a funny thing. It's like, you know, you date somebody for a really long time and then you propose and then you spend $4 on the wedding ring. <laughs> <laughs> like there you go. A, a month or whatever that happens to be like, it, it, it's a big deal. It's the last step. It's the culmination of all your work. It's the last place you skimp on because it impacts every decision that you've made up until then. Yeah. I mean, I would go, I would also say like, you know, if you can afford to go to a, a proper separate mastering engineer for it, that's, it's well worth it, especially in this day and age where like it's been said, you're, you're probably going to hear that mix over and over again. And only that one same environment of your, of your home studio or whatever, um, just to to get it in the hands of somebody who doesn't have any kind of preconceived notions about it, who hasn't like doesn't have that song like rattling around inside their head, mm -hmm. you know, and gets get some some honest feedback. Um, it's it's worth it. And, you know, I know that, you know, sometimes the budgets don't permit, but um, but yeah, it's it's definitely worth uh, tackling the process in the best way in the you know, to the highest degree you can you can manage. It's also really fun and satisfying sure yeah <laughs> you know, it's like we spent our careers doing this i mean if you'd have told me when I, I remember when i was at college and i kind of first thought oh i could be a studio engineer that would be cool i imagined myself recording and mixing if you told me that i was you know just doing stereo processing on and that i would find that satisfying and i mean i it, it still amazes me i find ma mastering kind of somehow magical because it's like you make these tiny little changes over these songs and it just transforms the end result um and I, yeah, I, I, I agree. If, you, if you're still watching this, listening to us uh, talking about this stuff, you, you need to have a go at this stuff and just experiment and have fun with it. Yeah, well, it's kind of like if you grew up with component stereos too, or like my first car, I had a 15 band graphic equalizer that I installed under the car stereo. I just spent all day tweaking. I mean, it was a danger on the road because I was just trying every little frequency and seeing how it sounded, how it could make the music better. Um, next question, really quickly. Dylan Schroth asks um, for you again, Chris, remind us about the headphones that you were saying you really liked. He wants to remember what oh, they're yeah. called and which versions uh, they were. These are Odyssey LCD Xs. Uh, I have these and I have the MX4s. Uh, these are sort of studio classics. Um, and if you, I'm going to, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. If you go to chrisgrammastering.com slash headphones, you can get 5% off these at Odyssey. Um, I work with them a lot. They have, ridiculous magnets let me demonstrate this is a twisty these are my headphones this is a twisty sticking to my headphones nice <laughs> they're they're crazy uh but i i'd never heard anything like these until i put them on and it was just like this is how good headphones sound this is oh look at all that armpit sweat oh geez <laughs> They awesome. sound really, really, really wide. And from a mastering standpoint, that really helps me to place uh, where there are negative side effects from too much compression or EQ and stuff. So I love them. I think they're spectacular. They, they sound so good. They make you sweat. Yes. <laughs> there we go. That's I was listening to them earlier. You know, another good plug, uh, plug for, for good headphones is like I, I moved from New York to Nashville a couple of years ago. So that also entailed moving studios. And what I did before I left New York is I found a pair of headphones that I liked and learned them really well. And that enabled me to help make the transition when I came into a new room and didn't oh, know what totally. I was hearing. And for you guys who are moving around studios or might be working at a friend studio or in and out of recording studios to have a pair of headphones that you can take with you and plug in and, and be like, okay. And then listen to the monitors and be like, okay, now I have an idea of like, you know, of what I'm hearing. It's, it's really invaluable to have that, to have that. Yeah. And I don't, I don't use them a lot anymore, but when I first started in this room, I had the headphones on and off constantly. Yeah. They let you travel. They let you transition. Yeah. And boy, having that in your back pocket is a heck of an insurance policy. Yeah. And so one final tip on headphones. Um, I want to try the Audi Z, um, but um, I do have the, the Sennheiser HD 650s, which are, you know, they're only a few hundred dollars. Um, but the other thing that we haven't talked about that you might want to experiment with, and it's a slightly controversial topic, but um, I have a custom Sonarworks profile for those headphones. I don't use Sonarworks on my monitoring. I mean, it, you, you guys probably know about it. It's a piece of software that will tries to improve the EQ response of either your monitors or your headphones. Uh, sorry, hitting the mic. Um, but um, so I haven't tried it on my monitors and I'm skeptical about it for monitors because uh, monitors in a room is a much more complicated beast but i, I will say that um the you know they have a generic profile for kind of you can you can just get it and go oh hd 650s okay and that will 
change the sound and maybe it's a bit of an improvement, but I wasn't completely convinced by it. But when I got the custom profile for that specific pair of headphones, um, that really did make a dramatic improvement to the point where, you know, I was listening to my, to my playlist, my reference material and kind of going, yeah, that sounds, that sounds about right. I totally um, agree. Um, Sonar Works sent me a, a pair of 650s with the custom profile. We almost did like a sponsorship deal with them a number of years ago. And it was like, oh, th that's cool. That sounds great. Yeah. I think um, that's I'm, great. And it's a good reminder, guys, the way you guys talk about learning the headphones, because I think most of us, before we have great headphones or flat headphones, we don't know what that sounds like. So we have to relearn what music sounds like with those and we can start making the right decisions. Um, here's the next question. This comes from uh, Gaetano Vaccaro. Um, Hi, all. Thanks for being here. Wondering how to figure out when something you're mastering has issues that need to go back to the mix. Some of these questions you guys have mm. kind of already answered. So if there's any closing thoughts or if we've already answered it, we'll just keep moving right through them. I could add something very quickly on that. Um, things that there's stuff that you can't fix in mastering. So some classics would be if you have one instrument that's out of phase, um, meaning the polarity is inverted on one channel. Um, it's happened to me with bass and piano, piano especially, I think, because it's quite a wide instrument. Mm. Sometimes people do it deliberately to get a kind of cheap stereo effect. Um, not cheap, easy stereo effect. Um, sometimes it's because there's a, a, a bad cable. Um, it doesn't always sound terrible. It's not to my taste personally, but um, what will happen is if you hit mono or if you listen to it on a phone or a, um, a smart speaker, whatever that, especially if it's a mono instrument to begin with, like the bass, it will completely disappear. So that to me uh, is, you know, that's a problem. That's something that I need to at least make the client aware of. Um, there are probably a few other things. I mean, you know, massive distortion that I think is not a creative decision, that kind of stuff. I mean, we, we all talked about, we all agree that we don't like, there are some clients who like having their mixes sent back to them. I know there are some mastering engineers where step one is, okay, you need to fix this, this, and this. That's not me, and it sounds like it's not uh, Chris or Ryan either. Um, Maybe but, a little more me, yeah. <laughs> okay. If I get a mix that I think is, has been pushed too hard, is too dense, because the, the thing that I'm hearing a ton of these days is overly saturated, overly too much parallel compression, too much mix bus compression, just the mix is too squashed, right? And it doesn't give me the control that I want over the dynamics at the mastering stage. Although, I, but I'm aware that there's there's a decent chance that if I ask them to switch that off, as we've talked about, the mix will actually fall to pieces. So in that situation, rather than just kick it back, my approach is to do the best master I can with what they gave me to respect their vision and their art. And then I will send it and, and I'll say, here you go, this is my, um, you know, this is what I think is right for, for this mix. Um, I can't help wondering whether it might sound even better if it had a little bit less of whatever it is, I think that is not quite right. You know, um, if you're interested in that, I'd love to do the experiment. And if it's easy for you to just send me a version, which is a little bit less pushed, a little bit less hard, um, I would be really curious to hear that. Um, I find that's really effective. It doesn't, it doesn't usually offend people. <laughs> um, and, you know, if they need it tomorrow, they can just come back and say, no, that's what we got, go with it. And it's okay, job done. And the master's done, nothing's held up, everything can proceed. But if it's a client who's like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, no, we used the thing and, it, you know, okay, we'll hit. And then they send you something. Um, actually, my track record with that is pretty good. I, I can say that every time somebody has sent me a mix that was pushed less hard, I've managed to get a result that everybody is happier with, that I'm happier with, that they're happier with. Um, so I think it's a worthwhile step. Um, for this sounds well. weird, Ian, but that like makes warm and fuzzy feelings well up in me that you that you do that. So kudos. All right, Groovy. So I'm, I'm trying to skim through the questions here because some of them we've kind of really, you guys have answered multiple ways. Um, but here's one that's related to that too, about the, the levels and the volume. Uh, this comes from Zach Hughes. Could you guys talk a little bit about your philosophy for handling the peaks of a track you are working on? For example, you're given a great mix to master that has a max peak of uh, minus 0 0.01 dBFS. Now what? How would you achieve optimal loudness while caring for those sweet, sweet transients? Anybody who wants to jump in with that? You use a really good limiter. <laughs> Um, and you don't push it too hard. I mean, I, I personally don't care too much about peak level. Peak level 
Um, that, that sounds wrong. What I mean is the peak level is kind of interesting, but it's only important in that if you take away too much of it, you do lose the transients. Um, so if something's peaking at zero, that doesn't bother me providing it's not clipping. Um, and I don't pay any attention to it. I run it through the chain. I do what I think makes it sound great. Um, and then I'll do my AB comparison with the loudness match to make sure that it sounds great. Um, hopefully what I did doesn't have any impact on it. You know, I mean, I, my whole goal with mastering processing is to be invisible. I don't want somebody to listen to a song and go, wow, listen to the mastering compression on that. Yeah. I want them to go listen to it and go, this song makes me cry or this song makes me happy or that's the most amazing vocal I've ever heard in my life. Um, so whatever it is that I do at the mastering stage, I want to be invisible. It's mastering is an artistic process for me, but it's not usually a creative one. It's, I'm not stamping my sound onto anything. I'm just taking what the clients have and make it even more so um, and just get it to, to their eye, what the, you know, try and get as close as I can to what they had in their head. Um, so that means that when I'm using things like limiting and compression, I'm using them as lightly as I can and as subtly as I can. Um, so usually if you, if you have something that needs a ton of processing, it needs that processing and it will sound so much better in so many ways that you won't notice that, okay, maybe the transients aren't quite as good as they were. Whereas if you get something where the transients are super important to the, the sound of it, then you're gonna to wanna to preserve them and you're not gonna to wanna to crush the level up anyway. Um, so, and, and yeah, the great thing is that these days, you know, the, like when I started out 25 years ago, it was, I don't know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars for uh, a limiter that would get anywhere close to a reasonable result. Whereas now you can buy a plugin for two or three hundred that will actually do you an amazing, do an amazing job. Um, so it's it's very achievable, providing you you're doing the right stuff with it. You know, it's it's not what you use, it's how you use it and what your goals are and what's involved in that process. All right, very cool. All right, so we're we're really near in the end here because it's going super late, and Ian, you are such a champion for joining us at this late hour. Um, here's one from William Wardlow, which is different. Nobody else has talked about this yet, which is, um, you know, he just said, could you guys touch on multiband? So when and how should we think about multiband in mastering? And maybe, Ryan, if you feel like starting on that one. Um, multiband's kind of a enigma. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got one that I use and I kind of have like a sort of starting point that I came up with a long time ago, but I'm kind of like, I'm not like, a, I don't love plugins and processing that have too many controls because I feel like I go down technical rabbit holes and I start mm. st stop thinking about the art of it and start thinking about frequencies and release times and all this other stuff. So um, I kind of have, I like the, I like multiband if you get it set right and that if it's used lightly, it can sometimes help kind of give a bit of glue and maybe a little bit of clarity to a mix that might be muddy, but um, I don't like to overdo it. And I also don't like, I, I almost like, I force myself to not think about it too much. I sort of like, will put it in, touch the two or three controls that I, that I kind of like to control and, and don't go much farther than that because like I said, I don't want to get like, I want to AB like, you know, like I said, like attack and release times of just the high band of, you know, of a multiband. But, um, but I think it does kind of work well as, as a sort of a glue compressor. I think multiband, um, I was going to make a joke of like, when should you use multiband? And I was going to lean forward and say, always, because <laughs> that's generally what I do. But multiband, you know, Ryan, you hit the nail on the head. It is so complex. There are so many variables in it. And so to ask a question about multiband um, is, yes, you should try it. It is extremely powerful. It is extremely useful. But just because, like, Formula One racers use a certain type of tires does not mean I'm going to put that on my Jeep Renegade. Those are specific use cases, and they're being used by a driver that's a lot better than I am. Multiband and, and midside are, are these two sort of – processes that boy if you overuse them it can get real weird real fast and if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know that it's getting real weird that can cause a lot of problems so i would say generally multiband is great but don't do more than a db maybe two of gain reduction 
um, with that unless you are really confident in what you're doing. It, it can run off the rails pretty quick. I'd agree with that too. Um, I'll, so I'll just, it's, it's interesting because we, we are all kind of of the same mind about most of these things. I actually use multiband quite a lot, but I have it set up very simply. Um, so for example, I only ever use three bands. Um, it's basically bass, mid and highs. Um, and I have it set up to sound as much like single band processing as I can. For me, the big advantage is that you can push it a little bit harder without causing uh, pumping, you know, that kind of the ducking yeah. in and out and especially of the, of the high frequencies. So um, as Ryan says, it can be helpful for, for getting some clarity in the mix, but I'm still trying to use it in a way that is invisible. Um, yeah. and I have a top tip for anybody who wants to experiment. Um, use the same settings in every band. So start out with the same ratio, same threshold, same attack and release times, whatever they are in each band. And if there's, if you've got one that has a link control so that you can change all of them at the same time, so yep. that they stay the same, that's the ideal. Because where multiband really gets confusing is where you have different settings in each band and they can be fighting against each other or going in opposite directions and it can get, it can get really weird. Um, and the next question that comes up when I say that from people is, well, what's the point of using a multiband if you have the same settings in each band? And the point is, each band does its job independently, right? So even though you have a two to one ratio in the bass, the mid and the high, if the bass is getting over the threshold, it will cause compression, but only in that low band or only in the mid band or whatever it, it is. So um, there's, there's still a difference, even though uh, I'm using it, as Ryan says, in a way that's as, as simple as possible. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, experiment with it, but it's not always necessary. So, you know, it's, um, but you need to kind of play with these things and figure your way around them to know when you do or don't want them. Um, so it is definitely worth experimenting with. Okay, cool. Um, so here's another question. This one comes in uh, from William Wardlow, but he's actually, I think he's actually asking it for Chaz, who's here with us too. Shout out to you, Chaz. Um, he said, and maybe you can also answer this in the context of multiband limiting, if we need to differentiate between those at all. But um, the question is, I would also like thoughts on limiter attack and release times. And um, anybody who wants to jump in on that. I'll just say very quickly, um, I completely agree with what Ryan says about not wanting too many controls. So um, I have literally just been playing with the new TC electronic um brick wall limiter they call it which is basically a software version of what i used to have in the old system 6000 hardware it's kind of a, a mastering classic um and i was just so pleased because it has hardly any controls it does have some controls but it's basically it kind of works um so i don't really care about that stuff um once i've got one you know once i've figured out what works for me with a particular limiter if i'm going to use it um, I don't want to be constantly messing about that with that stuff. If, if, if the limiter requires me to constantly tweak those settings, I'm going to lose patience and I'm going to move on to something else. Um, and the, the, one of the reasons I can get away with that is I use limiting very lightly. And again, cause I'm trying to be invisible. Um, so it's kind of less critical. You know, if you have a good limiter doing a good job, it probably doesn't matter that much what the difference is. Um, although having said that, one of the things I like about the TC is it managed to deal with a really tough, track with a huge 808 kick in it um really cleanly where the fab filter didn't so the brand is not irrelevant <laughs> multi-band limiting never do it don't really see the point all right yeah, neither, <laughs> neither do i and i would say it's, it's a little hard to talk about exactly like times like tech and release times because they don't necessarily react the same way across different plugins yeah because different algorithms are written the same way so i, I mean but i am kind of like ian that I, I mean i've got sort of like you know, like preset starting points for different plugins that, that just generally generally kind of work. And then, you know, I can choose which one to use or not use and, and maybe make small adjustments to, you know, within the track. But, uh, you know, I would say just, you know, experiment. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the higher end plugins that come these days, they, they come with presets that are usable to start with. So yeah. that's a good place to start. I mean, a lot of times I get something new um, that I'm just playing around with. I'll I'll just do that and be like, oh, what do they got in the preset menu? And if I find something that I like, then I start I use that as a starting point to to build off of. Uh, one thing that's just occurred to me that might be helpful for people um, that I haven't said yet. It, I mean, EQ is everything in mastering. It's like I mean, loudness is everything. But once you've chosen the loudness, I I, I mean, 
level and EQ for me are like 80% of, of uh, what's needed. You know, all the other stuff, MS, um, the dynamics processing, stereo width, saturation, all these kind of fancy, you know, all the rest of it. That's so, so I will spend some time sorting out the dynamics. I'll send the, the level you can set very quickly, but then the lion's share of the work for me is getting the EQ right. Um, and you can just kind of achieve minor miracles with tiny little EQ moves. You know, it's like, I can't remember what it was. There was one track I was working on once. It always sticks in my mind. And I was kind of listening to it and thinking, oh, that snare's a little bit um, woody and thumpy. You know, it'd be nice if it had a little bit more air in it. But, you know, there's no way I'm going to, oh, I'll just try it. And I ended up with like minus 0.6 with a Q of something really narrow. Um, and it's like bypassing it in and out was like night and day. I couldn't believe the difference it made. And it was this tiny little move. Mm. So um, yeah, EQ is everything. That's awesome. All right, let me jump to um, closing questions here. Um, are there, this is from Ben Malo or Malat, if I'm pronouncing your name right, hopefully. Are there any situations that you would prefer STEM mastering? Do no. you? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not I mean, prefer. if you want to send me an instrumental and a vocal, just so that if, if I need a vocal up, I can make it, that's not the end of the world, but... I don't want to, I'm not a mixing it, you know, you mix it, I'll master it. I, I've asked for stems occasionally. Um, every so often you'll get something and you listen to it and you go, okay, this could be better, but probably through the conversation, you know, you, you send back some comments and then you get some replies and you just have this sixth sense that if you ask them to do mix revisions, things are going to get worse. Um, and it's probably just easier. Oh, I thought of one other thing you can't fix as a mastering engineer. The classic problem would be, for example, vocals that are super bright drum sound that's super dull, right? So you add some EQ to brighten up the drums and the vocal goes out of control. Um, so you take it back and the drums get dull again. That's um, not necessarily a, a cause for a mixed revision because it could well be a creative decision and it's just our job to find the perfect balance. Um, but that's one of those things. And, but if, you, if I had a mix where that was like really impacting the, the, the ability of the song to translate and to, to do its job musically, then I might, ask for stems in order to achieve that. And some, some customers, uh, clients specifically request that I master from stems and I will do it, but it's, uh, it's more time, it's more expensive for them. They miss out on the learning experience of fixing whatever it was that needed to be fixed. So I'd, I'd never say I prefer it. Um, this one's very quick um, for you, Ryan. Bar Barry, um... Hadrikurasu. I um, apologize. I don't know if I can pronounce that right. Um, what did you mention? What headphones you were referring to earlier? Me? Yeah. Uh, no, I've got these. Um, I've got them right there. These uh, PSBs. That's, that's what I've been using. Okay. I'm not sure mm -hmm. what the model number is, but I don't think they only make like one or two models. PSB is the brand. All right, we'll do this one quickly too. This is um, from Pedro Vanutagam. Um, from hi from Belgium. Do you guys have some names for good mid-side EQs? I've been using Isotope before, but not anymore. Um, I use the Fab Filter EQ in mid-side mode a lot. Fab Filter is nice because you can uh, choose mid-side independently for each EQ node, um, and also you can control whether it's linear phase or minimum phase. Um, if you if you're doing heavy processing with mid-side, then linear phase is probably a good idea because as well as the EQ changes, you can get some phase changes that maybe won't work depending on where the instruments are panned in the image. You can, they can kind of fight and kind of do interesting stuff. So, but I mean, providing it's it's implemented right, it's, I mean, for me, EQ is less about which one you use than it's, it's more about kind of usability. Um, so I like FabFilter, the EQ, just because it's it's super easy to use. Um, yeah, me like, too. With the, for with that the new, exact same with reason. Pro-Q3, like the, it has dynamic um, EQ options. Uh, those are occasionally useful for, for dealing with something really specific. Um, and it, with the Fab Filter, they're just really easy to dial in, you know, but there are a ton of other plugins that um, also do them. If you want a really affordable, decent EQ with some good dynamic stuff, you could try the TDR Nova EQ. Uh, they actually, there's a free version of that if anybody wants to try playing around with that. But yeah, kind of, not super important what i mean unless you're kind of you want an emulation of a manly massive passive or something kind of you know for for sort of flavor um then if you're talking about digital eqs then it's whatever you like really 
Okay, awesome. Last question of the night, guys, I promise. This is, but nobody had asked it before. So um, this comes from PR. How about the need of a DSer in mastering? Chris, do you want to jump in on that comment? Um, well, I'm, uh, I love multi band compression. So, like, I, I, it is very rare for me to have no multi band compression in a, in a mastering session unless it's like classical music or something like that. Um, I don't use a DSer because it, a multi band compressor, compressor can do DSing and it can, I think it's a little bit easier to work globally with the entire song rather than having just some weird thing that's just slamming all of your high end on and off like it would in a mix. So I I try to avoid doing that, but if I have to, I'm gonna use a multi-band compressor. Um, I I use DSing both analog and in plugins. Um, I cut vinyl, so that's it's really part of um, it's a big part of that world because sibilance on a record is no good. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I find I use it quite often and I've actually kind of, um, kind of coming from cutting vinyl, but um, I use it a, a bit artistically sometimes too. It can be a, a, a good, a good deesser can sometimes help you control um, out of control symbols, hi-hats especially. Um, so, you know, it can be useful for more than just vocals. Um, it's, it's, you do get to spend some time, you know, playing around with it to, um, to make sure that, you know, it isn't going to like, you know, slam your whole mix, like, like Chris said. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I find it DSing to be an invaluable mastering tool and also in MS mode, because that you can, you can hit the vocal and not hit the cymbals or mm. vice versa. Yep. I'll, I'll just say I don't like using it, but you have to sometimes. Um, and uh, yeah, then I would echo what the, what the guys have said. One, I don't know whether to, to recommend it. There's a plugin called uh, Soothe by Irk Sound, which is kind of a bit like a DSer, but it, um, it were going on all kinds of kind of weird spiky resonant frequencies. And it's another Spider-Man thing. It's like, you've got to be really careful because it can seriously mess some stuff up. But if you have a really kind of challenging um, issue, DSing kind of issue, that can be useful. Um, but actually, again, I mean, the FabFilter uh, DSer I found in terms of software is, is pretty good. Um, the classic in, in mastering is the Vice um, DSer, which is now available as a plugin. I think SoftTube of emul uh, was not an emula emulation, it's a port. It's literally exactly the same as the, the old hardware. Um, so yeah, it's, Sometimes it's it's invaluable, but it's it's so, much better to get it done in the mix. Um, so, but I mean, it can work. And I, I'll offer this, and just in case anybody ever feels like complaining about the price of a quality plugin, when you mention something like Vice, I'm going to guess that that DSer used to cost about ten thousand dollars to buy one for your studio, right? Something like that. Yeah. Okay, you guys are such champions for doing this with us. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you, all of you who have been here joining us tonight. Just incredible. Um, again, a round of applause to MVP for the night, Ian Shepard, joining us. I think it's about 1.30 in the morning where you are. Um, great. Let, let me do closing stuff. So, um, Ryan, can you please let the rock stars know where, where can they find you? Where should they go follow you? And if they need to um, get their next record mastered, where should they reach out to you? Well, they can find me on uh, sterlingsound.com. Uh, you can, uh, I'm on Instagram, RKS with Smith is my handle there. Um, yeah, that's, that's either of those places you'll find me easily enough. Awesome. I almost couldn't get to my mute button there fast enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, Ryan. Yeah. Um, pleasure. Ian, please let the, everybody know where they can find you. I'm everywhere. <laughs> Um, so the website is productionadvice.co.uk. Um, there I have a podcast called The Mastering Show, um, which you can find on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and uh, if you're interested in the kind of stuff that we've been talking um, about in this webinar, I just, uh, I mean, or the, I've just done a series of videos for Sound on Sound magazine. Um, if you Google for Mastering Essentials and look for the Sound on Sound link, you'll find it. And it kind of just walks you through the my entire mastering process, which having talked to Ryan and Chris, it sounds like we all pretty much agree on. Um, 
hopefully people would find that really uh, helpful. And I'm on Facebook and Twitter as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you for being here, dude. We, we owe you a great, huge debt of gratitude for staying up so late. No, you're welcome. Um, Chris Graham, please tell us where where should everybody go find you and learn more about you and your music and, and get their next record. Master. Yeah, so uh, a couple places. So uh, Instagram is the easiest place to connect with me. Chris underscore Graham, spelled like the cracker, G-R-A-H-A-M. Um, for mastering stuff, that's chrisgrammastering.com. Um, for business stuff, which uh, wasn't what I set out to do, but that took off and exploded, uh, the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast or chrisgrammcoaching.com, um, where we talk about how to help people grow their their small businesses, particularly in the creative industry, particularly in the recording arts. Um, but yeah, that podcast of all the stuff I make, the podcast is the best. So that podcast check is out great. the podcast. Well, Chris, thank you too so much for being here, man. All of you guys, fantastic. And all of you who have joined us here tonight, thank you for hanging out with us for so long. Um, this has been epic. So many great questions and and so many of you staying on during the entire workshops. So it's awesome. Um, and a huge thank you to OWC for hosting this and letting us all get together and do this. Woot. Thank you so much. Um, I want to remind you all that next month on December 17th, we're also going to be hosting another workshop that's going to be focused on mixing. It's going to share all kinds of insights on mixing in pro studios or mixing in your in your home studios. And we've got some pretty fantastic guests. Michael Brower is going to be joining us, Dave Pensato and Sylvia Massey. So Please stick around for that. Make sure to look for a link for the registration in the uh, notes to this when the replay goes up. And all of you, thank you for being here, guys. Thanks, Lidge.